Good morning, and welcome to Fridays with Frank, a lecture series sponsored by the Frank Church Institute at Boise State University. My name is Gary Wenske, and I am the executive director of the Frank Church Institute in the School of Public Service. The Frank Church Institute was established to honor the achievements and to carry forward the principles of Senator Frank Church. He delivered the first lecture on war or peace, the American role at Boise State University in 1982. Given today's challenges to democracies around the world, conversations like these are even more important. On behalf of the Frank Church Institute Board of Directors, our thanks to Oppenheimer Companies, C. Frederick Cornforth, and Community Development Inc. for underwriting this series on how democracies survive and thrive in the 21st century. Thanks also to Hollis Brookover and Milt Gillespie for sponsoring today's session. Today's guest speakers will address why leading globally matters locally. Liz Schreyer, is the president and CEO of the US Global Leadership Coalition of over 500 business and non-governmental organizations that advocates for strong US global leadership through development and diplomacy. The US GLC with advocates in all 50 states has a bipartisan advisory council chaired by General Colin Powell which includes all living former secretaries of state and a national security council with some 200 retired generals and admirals. She also serves on the US Agency for International Development's Advisory Committee on Foreign Aid. Joining her this morning is Tom Dine, who served as president of Radio Free Europe in Prague and assistant administrator for Europe and Eurasia at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Both Tom and Ms. Schreyer were colleagues on the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Currently, he is president of the American Friends of the Czech Republic and a member of the Board of Directors of the Frank Church Institute. A reminder, if you have questions for our speakers, please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any time during the session. Let's begin this morning with Tom Dine. Tom? Thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure here, although I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, I feel like I'm in Boise, and it, it, it's good to be in, involved with the people in the Frank Church Institute. Uh, my, my, my memories of working five years for Frank Church are, are still vivid, uh, and when you just use the phrases, uh, Frank Church's principles and his achievements, uh, that sent a chill uh, through my body. So the question this morning uh, that Liz and I will try to address, and I'm looking forward to what she has to say because she's been a star in what she's been pursuing over the last decade or more. Why leading globally matters locally? And I don't think anything could be more graphic than the COVID-19 pandemic where the United States, normally the leader of the, of the world, whether it's free or not so free or even uh, restricted and autocratic, <clears throat> is not leading. There's a new book out, uh, which I recommend to anyone to read, is by Charles uh, Kupchin. He's an old friend of mine, his brother uh, as well, they're twins. But uh, Charles's new book is entitled Isolationism, uh, and basically how the United States under George Washington's aegis uh, in his farewell address said, stay clear of permanent alliances. Well, we're involved in permanent alliances today and for the right reasons at the right places at the right time. Uh, NATO, uh, we have a quasi relationship, more than a quasi relationship with the European Union, with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, um, even the Philippines and Taiwan, which I think ultimately over the next 50 years or so will, will emerge as an independent nation. What links them all is democracy. 
And that is critical to my philosophy, Frank Church's philosophy, I think Elizabeth's uh, philosophy. We're engaged with these allies, we're engaged with the United Nations and its agencies. And for Idahoans, we're engaged in trade agreements. It's so critical for the Idaho economy, the agricultural uh, uh, environment. But the pandemic brings us back uh, to, to reality. If we don't lead, no one else will. And we've seen it, even within our own country, when we don't lead, the country doesn't follow. I, I've had uh, a variety of experiences, which Gary has, has mentioned. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. That was my first engagement in internationalism. I was with the United States uh, Agency for International Development in the former Soviet Union in Central Eastern Europe, and that's why I'm still involved with the Czech Republic, with Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and now the Frank Church Institute, which I think is doing a great job in promoting internationalism. So how do democracies survive? Let's put it on the table. These are basics. And it came up on Wednesday at, at the uh, hearing for, uh, for Judge Amy Coney Barrett when Republican Senator Ben Sass, Sassa of, of Nebraska said, what are the five freedoms? And she said, I can name four of them, but I can't name five. And I understood uh, her, her, her being flummoxed somewhat. Yes, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. And then uh, the, the Senator reminded her, the freedom to protect, pr protest or petition government, which Liz and I have been involved in in our previous uh, existence together. So I think this morning, uh, those five freedoms or more uh, should be part of, of what we talk about because that's going to, I think they're the, the building block, blocks and, and uh, the cement that holds together uh, worldwide democracies which are natural friends and allies of the United States. So Liz, do you have some comments on that? And how does your work fit into these freedoms? Tom, first and foremost, thank you, Gary, for including me. And when Tom reached out, anything that Tom Dine is part of, I want to be part of. So <laughs> the Frank Church Institute, uh, Tom is my mentor. I have learned just about everything that I do in my life many years later from Tom Dine. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be in, in, in Idaho. I was supposed to be in Idaho this summer um, hosting a uh, conversation I'm actually with uh, our Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chair, Senator Risch, and, and uh, I look forward to at some point getting to Idaho. Um, Tom, I love your, your, your opening about the freedoms. And I feel like that's what you and I have been doing all of our careers. You, you taught me how to engage citizen voices in the protection of freedom, to give voice to what they believe in. And um, maybe I could start by just telling a little bit about what, what I'm working on, which is the, the theme of this conversation, why leading globally matters locally, because it started with our work together at APAC. Um, when, when you and I worked together, we were one of the only um, uh, organizations out there trying to make the case to the American public that we should have the resources in the federal government to support our, at the time, foreign assistance, but it was really about making sure we, we were out there as Americans leading in the world with resources for our State Department, our USAID. And, and when I left, uh, it was a period of time where um, uh, we were just finishing as the world was you know, ending the Cold War and some of our fellow citizens thought we had won. We don't need to be involved in the world. And it was this horrifying moment when I look back on it where we diminished our, our cutting the budgets of State Department where you worked at the US Agency of International Development trying to diminish our, our Peace Corps, where you are a Peace Corps volunteer. And, and fast forward, you know, 9-11, and we can go through so many points of history where it was such a dangerous move. We found the lessons after World War I 
engage, disengagement in the world is a terrible idea. So that's where we actually, at what U.S. Global Leadership Coalition actually formed. I remember members of Congress literally bragging on the floor of the House of Representatives that they didn't own a passport at that time in the mid-90s. You know, a horrifying moment where that was a badge of honor. So we formed a coalition to try to engage the voices of citizenry like Gary, and we have an advisory committee in, in Idaho of uh, Skip Oppenheim, the Oppenheim community that supports this event, and Alex LeBeau and Senator uh, Hagedorn and, and many others that are part of Idaho community that, that bipartisan, that support these efforts to really engage a, a, a conversation about why engagement in, in, in around the world matters to us. Today, we're, as, as Gary introduces, we're 500 businesses and nonprofits, everybody from Walmart to World Vision, Coca-Cola to Care, Starbucks to Save, the Washington Post called us the Strange Bedfellow Coalitions. And, and, and where bipartisanship feels like it's, it, it's, it's, it's horrifying in Washington, we're so proud that we have bipartisan and support and every living secretary of state is a member of our advisory committee chaired as gary said by by colin powell and we have this strong um footprint of military leaders over 200 retired three and four star military leaders we have faith leaders and and it's all about the idea of two things that we do one is to protect the resources that are critical for state department usat our non-military civilian tools of engagement but the more important part is is kind of is what we're doing today is to create a platform around the country for members of congress to talk to their constituents about about why engagement matters locally. Why does it matter to our national security, our economic interests and our values and our freedom? And we can get into the conversation about what that looks like. We engage with candidates around the country and, and how those conversations transpire and what we've learned over time about where America is. And just as you said, you know, these are kitchen, these are kitchen table issues. I'm literally almost sitting on top of my kitchen table because COVID, you know, what, what is more kitchen table than that? We're all in our homes exactly for that. So I'd love to get into that, that part of the democracy conversation. You brought up a bipartisanship. It's barely in, in existence today. <clears throat> the House of Representatives, the Senate in particular, but even at the state level. How do you bring opposing parties, opposing factions together? How do you form coalitions? You know, what's, what's fascinating is we, we, you and I both know, everybody on this, this call knows that there isn't a lot of bipartisanship. There's, you know, they cannot get a deal on a COVID relief package going on right now. And we're seeing it play out, obviously, in the, the hearings that you mentioned. But this is one area in terms of our engagement in the world, not on everything, but at least on, um, on, on, this, on the need for democracy and on the need um, for uh, supporting our partnership and working with others around the world where there is support. After 9-11, uh, the 9-11 Commission, everybody knows set up the Homeland Security Department. But what a lot of people don't realize is it also focused on what the causes for this unrest were all about. And it was not just state actors, it was infectious diseases and lacks of water and lack of education. And so there was this new understanding that we had to invest in this toolkit. And there was this bipartisan awakening that as former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates said, we cannot you know, fight our way to victory and we better focus on these toolkits. And what we have seen is that there has been this plethora of legislation after legislation on investing in women and girls and investing in wild, you know, fighting wildlife trafficking and, and investing in, in basic education that has literally had support from Freedom Caucus to Progressive Caucus. When this administration has called for massive cuts um, of of uh, the, the international affairs budget, the, the, the foreign assistance programs and more. And it has been 
overwhelmingly rejected by both sides of the aisle from both extreme sides. And it happens for that because there is this strong bipartisan coalition. And I have hosted hundreds of town hall meetings in districts around this country where it is just as likely that a progressive caucus member as a freedom caucus member will speak very often with different reasoning but come to the same conclusion. Is there a difference in these two extremes that you just mentioned between the far right and the far left? Yes, I mean, I, I recently hosted uh, town halls with uh, the, the co-chair of the, um, one of the progressive caucuses, Congresswoman Jayapal from Seattle. And she is an expert on global health. She had worked for the Gates Foundation. She comes from it in that direction. And, and she is um, very, very well versed in the issue and will talk a lot about similar to your opening, about the, the threat to our democracy, the threat to our global health. She knows about issues related to pandemic. I've also recently hosted a event with Congressman Ted Yoho from uh, the panhandle of Florida, who is a leading member of the Freedom Caucus, who actually ran on a platform to cut these issues and now is a champion. He will talk about a uh, an agency within this arena called the Development Finance Corporation, recently called OPIC, that he's very proud of his effort to help um, ch change it. He actually leads something called the Foreign Assistance Effectiveness Caucus. So he'll talk about, comes to the same conclusion, but he'll talk about it from a national security perspective. He'll talk about it from an economic uh, perspective, that if we don't get involved, who's going to be there? Just what you said. Who's going to be there? Others where China will be there. Well, let's just stick on this example because this is fantastic. <clears throat> Somebody from the Florida Panhandle who's an internationalist now. There had to be something that finally reached his brain. Was it a, was it a local incident? Was it a local uh, economic uh, entity of some kind? Or was it he, he read the right book? I think there's a series of things that happen. For, for him in particular, I think uh, the engagement of China made a big difference, but it's also two, two things I'm gonna point to. The, the, first and foremost, it's the world and where America fits into the world. So I think that makes a, an enormous difference. I would say that's true as I have gotten to know uh, Senator Risch and the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, your, your uh, senator. Um, second, I think members travel, and I'm so glad that more members, are, obviously not right now. I took a member of Congress from Minnesota, a, a congressman at, when his, his freshman year named Tom Emmer. He's a very conservative member of the House. In fact, for those that don't know, you might know the name. Uh, his, the, the head of the Tea Party was his predecessor, and I took him to Sub-Sahara Africa. He had spent most of his, time, like his career before that as a radio talk show, absolutely criticizing foreign assistance. The first three days of the trip, he was so quiet and I had no idea what he was thinking. And I frankly was a little worried that he wasn't liking this trip. And I thought, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? But he went on the trip because one of his constituents, the CEO of Lando Lakes, who was on my board, asked him to go. And that's the third part I'm gonna to get to. Well, we went to a very rural part of Kenya called Eldoret, Kenya. You may know of it because that's where the great runners of the world come from. And we went to a farm. I dreamed to be one of them. Yes, I know you did. So we <laughs> went to this farm and he finally started talking. He's like, now I get this because he's from a very rural part of the Minnesota. And in the farm, the, this woman through a translator starts talking about the fact that before USAID shows up with a program called Feed the Future, she couldn't, she couldn't even pay for her kids to go to school. But USAID, through effective um, aid, I won't go through the whole story, but she now can not only send all five of her kids to school, but she has three healthy cows. She's taught all of her neighbors everything that she learned, and it's a, an amazing success story. He is now like 
our champion. He speaks for us all over the country and he runs the National Republican Campaign Committee. The story, going back to my third point, so the world changes, he goes travel, but the real reason is the third point, constituents. The citizen piece, so I am traveling to Minnesota after this to speak for World Food Day, which is today, at a panel in Minnesota with two mayors and um, Cargill. It's all about the citizen activists. And Tom, that's what you've taught me all my career. What we have built is a citizen movement that can tell the story about why this matters locally. And that's what it's all about. Wow, that's heavy stuff you just gave us. Um, are there any other examples that go from an extreme rejection of internationalism, in this case, development and democracy, to a more moderate uh, position in which they can form coalitions to get something done? There, um, I remember a congressman turned senator in the state of Colorado that was not particularly active in foreign policy um, as a House member, which Tom, you know well, House members tend to be, unless you're on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, not particularly active in foreign policy, right? It's not a grade A committee in the House. T changes in the Senate. So yeah. this member of Congress becomes a senator many years ago, and I invited him to one of our town hall meetings. We, we walk in, it's in Colorado, and we have 600 people in a ballroom in Colorado. And I watched this now new, newly uh, new senator do the room, and I'm wowed. I mean, everybody's calling him by his first name. He is shaking everybody's hand, and I'm blown away. And I, he gets introduced by the second largest employee in the state, Lockheed Martin, and he is going to be on stage with, um, with a, a former, um, the, the head of the University of Colorado's foreign policy school, a former ambassador, and sitting on the other side of him is Jim Mattis, who is in between being a general and being the Secretary of Defense. At that point, he had no idea he was going to be Secretary of Defense, and moderated by a very well-known, at the time, Republican um, uh, journalist. And as he's being introduced, he whispers to me, and everybody at the table are his largest supporters. Big money is sitting around that table. And he whispers to me, he says, oh, my constituents don't like foreign aid. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is gonna be a disaster. <laughs> and I said, Senator, say whatever you're comfortable with. What am I gonna say? He gets up there, and by the end of the, of the, of the conversation, he kind of stops all the other panelists and he says, you know what we need to do? We need to tell our constituents, here are the five reasons why it's so important to support foreign aid. Because why? He's surrounded by all these constituents and he has a, he has a business leader and a military lead, former military leader and an ambassador that are giving him a political hug and it's okay. Fast forward six years later, this is one of our biggest champions on the issue. And I have dozens and dozens and dozens of stories like that. That public hug. But is there, besides the hug, is there retribution involved? Or, you know, there are I, consequences in politics all the time. So what I have not seen a anti, I mean, it's a, it's a very different experience than the early years where you and I were really challenged in this. And I, I'll, I'll tell you why, I, I know Senator Frank Church didn't love this topic, but I think part of the reason that it has changed is, is I, I teach every semester, uh, Secretary Madeleine Albright teaches a class at um, Georgetown called the National Security Toolkit. And she's kind enough to invite me one of her classes to teach its different trade and use of force. And I teach the one on aid. And I just did it last, last week on, on Monday. 
and and I I have to update it every every semester. I'm amazed. And I think one of the things that if he were here today in this conversation, what he might see is how much development has changed. Because in the 90s, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it wasn't such a great tool. It was pretty, there were some parts of it that were not very effective. And I think the reasons there's not that, that pushback in the same way is because there's really been efforts to, to make it more transparent and effective. And I'll, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due, and that's President George Bush, who not only did PEPFAR, our fight against HIV AIDS, which was so important, it saved 18 million lives, but he also created something called the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which put benchmarks and transparencies and all kinds of things that said, if we're going to give funding to other countries, we're going to make sure what the return on investment is. And it had an incredible impact about how we do it and do it well. So I don't think we get the same kind of pushback we did a decade ago. Well, I'll go back even further than that. In the 50s and 60s, you had American foreign assistance uh, helping uh, authoritarian governments. Exactly. And that was Frank Church's big thing. Totally. You know, I remember uh, AID supporting the police in Brazil, who and then in turn became very good at torturing people. And he went off, he went off the reservation for, because democracy was key to him in his right. internationalism, which had its modifications. So, so today it's... Uh, as you said, I, I think Secretary of State Clinton used the phrase uh, defense and development. You used it in your, one of your opening uh, paragraphs. Uh, and it, it's true. They go together, hand in hand, hand in glove. So um, what about uh, let, let me ask a question, if you, if you don't mind, that's come uh, in. Uh, there are actually two related questions. Uh, given the strains of the global pandemic and economic crises, how should policymakers rethink America's role in the world? And a related question on whether the fear of the pandemic will create a fear of freedom. Oh, I think, Tom, you should start on that one. <laughs> um, there's there's a, a beginning to accumulate a literature about the fear of, of health the problems and therefore a fear of involvement in internationalism, so a fear of freedom. Uh, and this is where leadership comes in, leadership at the local level, state level, federal level. If you're going to have a robust world with a robust United States, you need to take on issues which are difficult but still are uh, necessary and to avoid extremism. You know, it's not such a bad deal to make coalitions because you do have to find the middle. It may be left of center, it may be right of center. Basically that's the middle, but you can't have extremism. So in terms of rethinking America, I, 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 I'm going to be a little partisan here. <laughs> I'm going to try not to be, but the Trump administration has not been very good at this at all. In fact, I would say they've been a failure, uh, but that gets me too far afield. We need in the next administration, Trump two, Biden one, <clears throat> uh, critical thinking. First of all, critical about ourselves. The way to heal uh, problems uh, is to be critical of ourselves so that we can get it right. And you may remember, Liz, after legislative battles, some we won, some we didn't win. I always did, so what did we learn? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? And I think that is critical even in a family, in a marriage, <clears throat> in friendships, uh, in the way Gary does his business at Boise State. Uh, I'm being a little vague here, and, but I'll give it back to you. But to be critical of America is to improve America, in my view. 
I, I would only add a couple things. There's no question, and I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know, is that you know the, the, this global pandemic is a wake up call where Americans were, you know, hor you know, horrifyingly reminded that what happens overseas impacts us, you know, in such an, a profound way. And we have done our own opinion research. You don't need to do opinion research to to be to see that so clearly. We did one poll that literally saw a thirty percent shift from the prior year that Americans even see that they connect and should invest in poor and fragile health systems around the world to places that they they you know probably don't necessarily even know the names or where they would not not because they're they're ignorant but because they don't pay attention to it and they now get that having said that there's real obviously issues every single day here but that connection to the world is so profound which means that exactly as tom said america has to have a seat at the table in the world stage and it's we cannot have moments where there are international vaccine conferences where we are not there. That we question, um, you know, should NATO play their, pay their fair share? Of course, but are we not at the NATO table? Um, so how we engage in the world is, could be, can be, we can talk about and debate but should we engage in the world is no longer up for debate. And that is where you can't have freedom if we are not part of that, you know, at, at part of the game and part of the table. And um, Americans from everything I see understand that since George Washington, there's always a very small part of America that's still in what we would call a hard isolationist Pat Buchanan part of this country. But Americans get that we have to be partners with the world. And that is a completely, that is connected to our security. It's connected to our health. It is connected to our economic well being. It is connected, Gary, to your question about our freedom. And we will debate how to do that in, as Tom said, whether it is Trump two or Biden one. Um, but there is no going back. And what we're going to do at USGLC is to make sure we're bringing that conversation directly with the American people and they are mobilizing to bring that directly to their policymakers because we were not prepared for a global pandemic, not because we didn't have the science, not because we didn't have the know-how, but simply because we didn't have the political will to invest. I'm going to add something here. Liz, and I don't know if you and I have really had this conversation, but I used to have it all the time with my mentor, Frank Church, that not only did all legislation have to be a coalition, he would be the D, somebody else would have to be the R, but he didn't go alone. And, and secondly, uh, the self-correction business uh, it was very important to him and I think that's why he stayed, as a liberal Democrat, he stayed in office for so long. And he was attuned to the, to the Idaho countryside uh, uh, and, and, and improved himself. Uh, and I think we've got to do that now uh, as well as a country uh, to self-correct. So let me get into another aspect of Frank Church. To know this Frank Church was to know a fighter. And that was, uh, we would not allow the executive branch to be in uh, our attorney general's terms, Bill Barr's terms, unitary executive. That is, the executive branch commanded everything and it was up to the legislative branch to fall in line. No, it has to be two competing branches of government. And he was very good at that. And I have followed him ever since in, in everything I've done. N not few checks and balances, lots of checks and balances. Um, not not uh, worship of, of authority, but swatted away 
and make sure that the best ideas win out. Any comment? It's hard. It's hard right now. Breaking through on anything right now is just extremely hard. And we all know that um, the, the, the media, the 20, I don't want to even call, you can't even call it a 24 seven news cycle. Everything's within seconds and amplified on Twitter. And we right. watch, you know, the, the, the cable channel that reinforces our own voice and our own, uh, you know, theory of change and viewpoints. And so it is, does not naturally lend itself to crossing the aisle and have conversations. I know Gary wants to ask a question. So the, 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 the system of rewards does not favor the Frank Church model, and that is the problem. Hmm. Yes, we have a couple of questions that are related, and you've uh, spoken a little about them. Um, with the latest polling indicating other countries view America in decline, what are the impacts on U.S. national interests? And a related question on how has China taken advantage of the current administration's uh, challenge in, in America's leadership? Well, there's no doubt about that, Gary. The, well, let's start with the latter on China. China has a sense of itself. It goes back for two millennia. Uh, and it is, uh, it is going to do it its way in accord with its model and it is emerging as a great power. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and as its economy gets bigger and bigger, second only the United States, some say it's already ahead of the United States. Uh, it's going to uh, try to um, pave the way for itself and its own self-interest. The Belt and Road stuff, everything. But it's, uh, it's critical that the United States collect itself, what are our interests, what are our values, what are our principles, and to pursue those with our friends. And I think that will be, uh, that'll, that'll make a, a big, big difference. Liz? When you go to, as many of you probably know, travel to, um, I, took a, I took a group over to, I think it was Zambia, the last trip I took to Sub-Saharan Africa. And the group was, people that were um, very, they were the, in the inner circle of, of the president, most of that, actually one of the people is actually running the, the re-elect. Um, and so they were pretty skeptical of um, seeing our, what we, what we do overseas to the non-military lens. And the first thing we saw when we landed is literally the airport made by China. And the first person said is, they're eating our lunch. And I felt like, mm, I can go home, they, they all get it. And the issue is, is, you know, Tom said, is, is they're everywhere. I'm watching what they're doing in our own hemisphere in the COVID industry. I saw a, this, the Mexican foreign minister this summer put out a tweet saying, thank you, China, for what you're doing in the pandemic with three exclamation points. They're going to be everywhere. Their Belt One Road initiative is, is seven times that of what we spent on the Marshall Plan. So the question, and this is an economic question, is what are we going to do about it? You know, we either walk away or we, we lean in because countries want America and, and our style of engagement much more than they want China's style of engagement. And so we got to step it up and engage because, you know, what we haven't talked about is the re reality is this is part of our economic future. 95% of the world's consumers don't live in our, you know, in the United States. They live outside. That's where our consumers are. And our engagement and our economic recovery, our health recovery of COVID and our economic recovery is going to be part of making sure that others all lift up with us. Uh, it, it cannot be solved by just what we're doing inside the, 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 the 50 states. Gary, I'd like to comment one, one, step, sure. further, one step further to your question about <clears throat> how badly are we hurt abroad because people disrespect us, don't like us, and put us into the worst kind of context. Nothing will do more for America than a free, fair, reasonable election in which 
the parties change hands. Because in their countries, for the most part, not, not the real democracies, but, but the general uh, world uh, as we know it, uh, there's no, there's no uh, nonviolent succession. So it's a very important that if the polls hold up and Biden wins, that the change of power, the change of the guard is with, without that kind of animosity and, and do as we've been doing since George Washington, that, that uh, there's a, a mature way to succeed one another and it's not anti-democratic. What would, if Biden was declared the, the winner over television uh, in the next two and a half weeks, Will Trump, the, the fear is Trump may, underline may, may declare the election uh, fraudulent. He may confiscate the ballots. He may declare martial law. The military is talking about that. Uh, both, both active uh, uh, armed forces people that I know, as well as the veterans, the, the alumni, We've seen already calling out the troops as he walked across Lafayette Square. And then he'll seek help from the Supreme Court to declare him the winner. Uh, so all those things are ahead of us, potential things are ahead of us. And it's so important that this election be carried out in the normal way that we have in the past. Uh, you know, nobody was more gracious than George H.W. Bush in losing to Clinton. He was a gracious man and he graciously didn't like the results, but he, he accepted them. And I remember clearly uh, how, how that went, came about and on it goes. So we'll see uh, what takes place, but I think that's the way for America to shine its light first on itself and then let the world see for themselves. Uh, getting beyond uh, this election, uh, how do you respond though, to those who argue uh, the U.S. has been far too interventionist and overreached in recent years? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, it's true. Uh, it, I didn't have to learn that from Frank Church. I, I could see it myself in, in, in a variety of ways. <clears throat> but um, Again, there's another book uh, that has recently come out on the, the folly of trying to overthrow governments. Uh, and the big, the big case study was overthrowing Mossadegh in, in Iran in 1953, where the Roosevelt family was intimately involved with the CIA and went about throw, overthrowing a duly elected uh, uh, Prime Minister, and it, it is, it's still alive today in U.S.-Iranian relations. Now, the Iranians are doing some very bad things now themselves, but they don't forget the past. And that's critical that for all of us. Those of us who've been trained in history know that, but most people uh, may not know that. Uh, what took place today, or yesterday, will take place today, and reverberate tomorrow and we've got to that's why we've got to really clean our house uh over the next couple of years I, I would just add one other thought to this gary is that um it's really interesting looking at how the conversation shifts to the political winds and i am watching the the the, the biden um, foreign policy team, which are people that have been around a long time in democratic policy circles, that um, a lot of which were part of the Clinton policy team, not all, but many were, but they were certainly many that were part of the Obama uh, Biden administration. And you see shifts of not um, that I think are, even though they're a very different policy, foreign policy that you can expect if they were to win versus a, a Trump administration, you don't see, it's almost like a dial. There's a dial when you 
see America saying we're going to be more aggressive in the world and a dial where you're saying we're going to be less aggressive in the world and starting to kind of go somewhere in the middle. And I think America's kind of looking a lot more like we're in the middle. And well, I think you see that. If I could just add one more thing, Gary and, and Liz, uh, because I'm still involved in Central European affairs, uh, particularly with the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic and Poland, not Hungary because it's become quote unquote illiberal and extreme. Uh, they're looking at us. They want us to win. They want us to win back our principles, if you will, and, and, our, and our way of doing business. Uh, and, and so we've got spectators that are rooting us on here. And it's very important that we root ourselves. In today's cyber world, uh, what role do agencies like Radio Free Europe play, or should they be ended like the U.S. Information Agency? Well, one of my ironies in life has been to work not only for Frank Church, but he voted against the continuation of Radio Free Europe <laughs> the way before I became a member. But uh, when the a, the scandal about the uh, CIA funding the National Student Union and places like that, the student groups in the 60s and 70s came out, uh, Church and others uh, in the Senate particularly voted to uh, rid the United States of these international broadcasters, Voice of America, Radio uh, uh, Cuba, uh, Radio Free Europe, and, and since then, there have been others that have been added to this family of international broadcasters. Um, <clears throat> but today, Radio Free Europe is alive and well. It's, it's, it's got a, a, a good fat appropriations. It's, its headquarters is in Prague, and it broadcasts to about 21 nations. When I was the head of it, we had 28 languages in uh, 22 different countries. Uh, and the biggest problem is Russia uh, in terms of its own lack of, of uh, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of the press. And this, this, this requires electronics, the technology to combat their efforts to, to fill the place with static uh, or, or other ways to, to ruin the broadcasting. Uh, so this is ongoing, and anybody in private broadcasting or public broadcasting uh, has to contend with this. Uh, Liz Schreier, um, you mentioned the Gates Foundation. We have a question uh, referencing the Gates' work in Africa, particularly as a very effective provider of foreign assistance um, how does the U.S. Uh, GLC work with uh, the Gates Foundation or similar agencies? Um, well, I can't speak for the Gates Foundation, but they're a, they're a partner. They're a, a supporter of ours, and they are a game changer. I mean, they have transformed the world. And when you look at what they have done and what they're doing right now in terms of the pandemic uh, response, what they've done, even right out of the box in Seattle, which was one of the first cities that was impacted by COVID. But what they're doing in terms of leading on not just vaccine development, but equitable uh, vaccine distribution. I led a conversation uh, just, uh, I think it was yesterday, with a uh, the, the head of Gavi, the vaccine uh, who's leading the uh, effort to, COVAX, who's leading the effort to uh, buy $2 billion, do, 2 billion doses of vaccine worldwide, and the recognition that we can't go native, nativism of our vaccines. Um, and, and the Gates Foundation is a leader in this voice of recognizing and trying to make sure everybody understands that if we only look out for ourselves, it will only come back to you know, to bite us because <laughs> there are no borders when it comes to infectious diseases. I start each of our town hall meetings with members of Congress with a night with a TED talk from 2015 of Bill Gates, which many of our viewers may have seen. And it is 
Bill Gates saying the greatest threat to us is not this, and he shows an atomic bomb blowing up. But he says, it's this. And he shows some microbe you know, of a pandemic, and he says it's an infectious disease. And I always say to the member of Congress, don't you wish we listened to him? And why didn't we? And it's the same point I made a few moments ago, which is we didn't have the political will, and why? And every member of Congress says, oh, we did. And the answer is, no, we didn't. And so I think the Gates Foundation is just at the leading edge and in so many of these issues, and they are putting their, their, their brains their, and their money uh, ahead of all of us, and, and we should keep listening to them. I'll add something to that. Uh, as, as Gary indicated in introducing me, that I'm the head of the American Friends of the Czech Republic. It's a, it's a fairly small uh, but national a nonprofit, and we're having a guest speaker next month, uh, a Czech bio scientist, PhD, at, at the Gilead Sciences, which is in California, and he's going to speak about the internationalism of finding uh, solutions, medical, uh, pharma, pharmacological solutions to these issues, and I think that'll be very interesting. If he's as good as I hope he is, Gary, I'll, I'll recommend that he speak to the Frank Church Institute. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, basic question we should have asked earlier, perhaps, is how large is the foreign assistance budget and how does it work? So it's, um, it's the, so the, the budget that we actually support is, call, is in wonky Washington world. It's known as the international affairs budget or even more wonky the 150 account, which I never let anybody use outside my office. Um, but it is, uh, it is a, five years on the Senate Budget Committee. <laughs> I know it is. It is just under $60 billion. Um, and it's made up of uh, it covers everything from the State Department, literally the bricks and mortars of our embassies around the world. Um, as well as our, our, our personnel, our ambassadors, and all the wonderful foreign service officers that, that are out there around the world protecting us. It is, covers our, our work in the multilateral, that means our, the World Bank and our UN, our, our contributions to the, to the uh, regional banks and the IMF. And it covers our economic support, so to the Middle East, like the Camp David Accord uh, resources, um, our humanitarian aid, so all of the, you know, the 80 million people on Earth that are displaced right now in terms of refugees, when there's a disaster that happens in the world, it covers that. Uh, our, our military assistance that supports, it, it, it covers that. So unlike when you say the transportation budget, where everybody says, I know what that is, or the education budget, where most people can pretty much figure out. Um, th there's really, we have two really bad words, foreign and aid. Um, neither of those are very popular, but it really is about our national security, our economic interests, and our, and our values is really what this is, this is about. It's about protecting our security, and particularly, as I said earlier, in a, in a moment of a global pandemic. Um, related questions, um, how is the private sector's interest in the develop developing world foreign assistance changed over the years? You know, it's, it, it's so interesting. When I started getting into this, I'll be honest with you, I largely was introduced to the meet the person from the foundation. So it was like a straight out of the corporate social responsibility, and that is not who comes through my door. It, it's often the CEO, you know, it's the, it's the CEO. This is so central to their bottom line. And that's because this is where their, their supply chain, this is where their customers are. This is where, um, this is, and this is where not, this is not about their shareholders. This is about their stakeholders. And all you have to do is take a look at what the business roundtable is talking about in terms of the voice that they are sending out. So what is happening is when you come to our board meeting, there are conversations going on. If we were 
out in the hall, now we're in virtual land, um, is where you know, Walmart is talking to World Vision about work that they're doing together in Guatemala about empowering women economically. Or um, Procter & Gamble is talking to CARE about a clean water program that they're doing in Sub-Saharan Africa. These are critical to the bottom line and PL of the business community. We just did a huge program, it's called the Global Impact Project, where we literally launched a report showing there's 1,800 public-private partnerships that USAID and State Department are doing. And it's not just about, hey, corporation, give money, because that's all you are. It's really about co-producing programs that are sustainable, which is why going back to our China conversation, much more important about doing something that's very real and very meaningful. And businesses are all in to development, sustainable development, and frankly, the sustainable development goals uh, at the international level. That was a profound uh, explanation. Thank you, Liz. A question, uh, what should be the relationship with uh, Latin American countries where um, many immigrants are coming to the U.S. as far as providing them with foreign assistance? Let me take that. Sure. So, you know, this is a, every four years I have seen for way too long, uh, policymakers say the top priority should be our own hemisphere and no one really invests in it. And, and uh, so I was all over the news when there was a effort to cut our foreign assistance to the Northern Triangle because we were dealing with obviously the huge migration coming up to our border and that was dealing with uh, with, with not the solution. The solution is there's a reason that there is unrest. What mother, I'll talk about as a mother, but I'll, a father too, is gonna take their child at risk and go to a border that they don't know what will happen, let alone be separated. Um, our programs, they, not every program is successful, uh, but there is a lot of programs that are, and they are making a difference, and what they are focused on in the Northern Triangle region, if we can get them right, and they were working, and frankly, what we did is we took our foot off the gas pedal, and we stopped funding programs that were dealing with the homicide, the crime, and the corruption, and that is what we should be spending money on in the Northern Triangle, and if we get back to that, it will make a difference, because bottom line is, Nobody wants to leave their home. People don't. People largely want to stay in their home, and that's what we should be investing in. And we're seeing even more problems. If you go to uh, the refugee crisis from Venezuela, we have 1.7 million refugees now in Colombia, which is making now Colombia a huge important trading partner for us, um, having some issues. So I could go on and on, but we should be investing more in our own hemisphere. But besides, uh, excuse me, go Gary, ahead. besides Venezuela and Colombia, uh, what is AID doing in Central America? There, there are huge programs going on in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador. Um, we, under the uh, president, Vice President Biden, had a program called the Lines for Prosperity, which is what we, I think, we took our foot off the gas pedal that was working. Um, the Trump administration cut off aid for a while in that region. I was very opposed to it. It is now back. Uh, USAID is back working on those programs. Um, and they are having a much better effect. And, it, and I'm, I'm pleased that we are back working with those governments. Um, there are some new leadership in El Salvador and Guatemala, particularly in El Salvador, and we're seeing, seeing good, good programs that are going on there. Do you know about any universities in the upper Northwest, state of Washington, Oregon, Idaho, uh, Utah, Mo Montana, <clears throat> that are involved in economic development assistance abroad? There are some incredible programs that are going on throughout the entire country. I don't know um, anyone, I don't, there, I'm sure there the are State very prime. The place for economic agriculture and economic development. Peter McPherson, who you of course know, former USAID administrator, now head of the Land Grants University Association, uh, has, uh, has been doing some marvelous work 
as well as USAID has programs called the Development Lab with universities that do agriculture programs all over the, the country. And there um, really been some of the innovative research uh, on ag development and research um, throughout the country. Okay. I was at American State, Uni Arizona anyway. State so University right. um, about a year ago, and they had a fair of all the programs that that USAID is doing with Arizona State University. Like there was one where there were live locusts that were that they were using to help um, uh, do um, create um, agriculture programs. Now we have locusts that are causing huge problems in Africa, but these were doing good work in Africa to help create and improve crops. And these were all coming with partnerships between USAID and in this case, Arizona State University, but it's happening literally all over the country. <laughs> okay, a final question for both of you, and then you feel free to sum up as you wish, but uh, a little off topic, but how do you both interpret what it means to be an American? <clears throat> well, that goes back to before the Revolutionary War, that question was asked. Uh, to me, it's living by principles, the principles of, of our society. Uh, and it gets back to the values that I mentioned earlier <clears throat> about what makes up a, a, a democracy. Uh, in listening to Liz uh, about Central America, South America, the, the critical is, is open societies dealing openly with problems. And uh, th that's an American value. That's what it means to be an American, to, to be open and to take different points of view uh, and to argue, but to do it uh, with decorum and, and with, uh, with purpose. I, I, uh, uh, I think I love our values. I love our society when it's working well. And I'm going to fight like hell to the day I die to make sure it, it stays uh, on target. I, I, I agree with all that. And I'll just add one personal story. So when my kids were born, literally the day, since the day they were born, I used to wrap them up in little swaddles on every time I went to vote. And I would, they, they were infants, and I would whisper to them, you don't understand what I'm saying now, and I would, I'm like gonna cry now, but I would say, we live in a country where we have the gift to vote. And when you grow older, you have to vote because there are people in this world that don't have the right to vote, or even if they have the right to vote, it doesn't mean anything. And that is what it means to be America and be American. And I am blessed. Then in another two months, I'm going to become a grandparent for the first time. And I don't know when my grandchild comes into this world in early January, given where we are, what the world will see of us as a, 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 a our democracy um, and, and if it has the elasticity to feel that way. But I believe in it. And I think that is the greatest gift of what it means to be an American. Thank you very much, uh, Liz Schreyer and Tom Dine for your uh, very timely presentation. Uh, note the next Fr Fridays with Frank will be held at, at 10 a.m. Friday, October 30th with two former Democratic and Republican members of Congress whose topic is elections have consequences. For student viewers, please join in the Boise State All Campus Challenge by going to idahovotes.gov. The stakes are too high for you not to vote. Thank you all and have a good day. <laughs>